<laughs> the Intercollegiate Psychedelics Network. My name is Julia Eklund, and I have just graduated a master's in neurochemistry. I completed my thesis at Uppsala University under, under the guidance of Dr. Ulf Brimber and Professor Luke Odell. Today I'm going to talk about psilocin esters, an investigation of synthetic feasibility, chemical and metabolic stability. But before we dive into that, let's take a moment to appreciate the individual parts that sparked our shared interest in the field. For a bit of context, I'd like to share my own story, which began when I was just a small girl. A child with enormous willpower that was both a gift and a curse. Every day of my childhood was a battle with anxiety, a storm that often ended up as angry outbursts that could last for hours, mostly towards my mother. My mother tried to help me, but like many others, I was overlooked by professionals as a highly intelligent girl with an exceptionally strong will. And right I might have been. I already knew what the world needed as a three-year-old. More hugs, less war, which is written in Swedish on the side. It was during my teenage years that my battles were given names. ADHD, Asperger syndrome, oppositional defiant disorder, and depressive symptoms. While these labels provided me some understanding, they didn't bring peace. Without proper support, school became an impossible challenge and I dropped out. I ended up in unfulfilling jobs, feeling adrift, unsure of my purpose, and constantly unhappy. Then, my life took an unexpected turn. A good friend invited me to work abroad. And in that foreign land, I was introduced to psychedelics, an experience unlike any I had ever known. It was as if the world fell silent for a moment, allowing me to truly see myself. I felt acceptance, love, and a deep connection to my family. The storm within me calmed, and for the first time, I could breathe. My struggles didn't vanish, but they became significantly more manageable, allowing me to see the world and myself with newfound clarity. Returning home, I was a changed person. My heart was set out on unraveling these mysteries of these life-altering compounds. Wanting to offer hope and healing to others who faced struggles like mine. Despite the challenges that formal education had posed for me, driven by passion and hope, I decided to go back to school. My journey led me to a bachelor's degree in chemistry, followed by a master's degree in neurochemistry, all with a single-minded focus to study psychedelics. As I began my master's thesis, my dream finally turned into reality. Thanks to a kind invitation from a researcher who gave me the opportunity to work on a project of my choice, a rare occasion most students would envy. It was hard to select what subject I wanted to delve deeper into. Truth to be told, I desired them all. After a long consideration, I selected the project I felt would help expand psychedelics as a treatment for people in need. You might not be aware, but medical researchers are currently paying between $175 to $250 for a single psilocybin dose. That's right, we each dose, but hold on, the plot thickens. Manufacturing challenges have created a supply bottleneck, further intensifying this dilemma. And here's the real flincher. Some researchers are finding it impossible to purchase any medical grade psilocybin no matter what they are willing to pay. 
For this matter, I should also spend countless hours in a lab, muttering, sweating, but also smiling because I knew the work I was doing could help change the future. So in our time together today, we'll first explore the background of psilocybin, then move on to the intriguing concept of psilocin ester prodrugs. We set clear research goals before immersing ourselves in the, into the exciting results. And to wrap things up, we'll weave all threads together into a solid conclusion. With our roadmap clear, let's start our journey, exploring psilocybin's background. Psilocybin is a hallucinogenic compound produced by certain species of mushrooms growing all over the world. These mushrooms have been consumed for centuries in both spiritual and religious contexts. Its modern journey, however, began with Albert Hoffman, the discoverer of LSD, who isolated the compound responsible for these hallucinogenic effects in the late 50s. As we transition into the 60s, Sandus Pharmaceuticals, recognizing the potential of this compound, began distributing psilocybin under the name Indocybin. This period was marked by most of the clinical studies performed with psilocybin, a testament to its growing significance in the medical field. However, despite its low risk profile and potential beneficial effects, psilocybin was classified as a controlled substance in 1970 a decision that brought its scientific exploration to a near standstill for more than three decades. Yet, history has a way of circling back. In recent times, there has been a renewed interest in psilocybin and its potential benefits, a topic that we will dig deeper into as we progress in our journey today. But before we delve into this renewed interest and promising potential of psilocybin, Let's take a moment to clearly define what psilocybin is and what do we know about it. Psilocybin is considered a prodrug to psilocin, which means it is metabolized into psilocin in the body. When ingested, the phosphate group is removed by phosphatases in the body, revealing the active compound. You can think of this phosphate group as a protective wrapping, a necessary measure for psilocin stability. But why does psilocin need such protection? Well, psilocin is chemically unstable and prone to degradation when exposed to oxygen and sunlight. So the packaging of the phosphate group essentially protects it from these elements. Having covered psilocybin's chemistry, let's go back to the therapeutic potential. Psilocybin has been recognized as a breakthrough therapy for depression by FDA. In addition, it's being explored for a range of psychiatric conditions, including end-of-life anxiety, substance use disorders, PTSD, and even autism. While these potentials are indeed exciting, more research is needed to fully understand the implications and to maximize the benefits from psilocybin-assisted therapy. And now we must also confront an obstacle large-scale production of medical-grade psilocybin. The main method of producing medical-grade psilocybin currently is through chemical synthesis. However, this approach is complex and costly, driving up the price of the resultant product. While it is possible to extract from cultivated mushrooms, it is not economically viable for drug research and development. So with these considerable challenges ahead of us, how can we fulfill the rising demand of medical grade psilocybin? One promising solution lies in the development of synthetic psilocin ester prodrugs. Let's look into this fascinating strategy that is emerging as a game changer for psilocybin production. Back in 1999, David Nichols introduced the idea of psilocytin, a type of psilocin ester prodrug as a possible alternative to psilocybin. Today, psilocytin and other synthetic psilocin ester products are seen as potential substitutes to address the growing demand for psilocybin. While psilocytin is speculated to metabolize into psilocin akin to psilocybin, it also appears to have its own psychedelic properties. 
anecdotal reports and emerging research suggests psilocytine could exert psychedelic effects independently, even before it transforms into psilocin. Our lab's preliminary trials show a slow conversion from, of psilocytine to psilocin, suggesting that some of it may indeed act directly on the receptor. But let's not overlook the concept of an ester prodrug itself. The idea holds merit. Recall the role of the phosphate group in psilocybin. It serves as a protective layer against degradation. An ester could serve similar protective function. You could think of it as changing the peel of a banana. The inside will still be the same. However, just like a banana, the prodrug must be easily peelable or metabolizable to ensure that the core component, psilocin, is effectively released. Considering the promising potential of psilocin ester prodrug, it's clear that they warrant further investigation, which brings us to why we are all here today, namely the research goals. The question we had was, would it be possible to develop a psilocin ester prodrug that is transformed into psilocin as soon as it is ingested? The essence really lies in how fast it is transformed. We are not aiming to create a new psychedelic compound, while this also would be interesting, but rather change the packaging. And why is this important? But the demand is increasing and the production is currently expensive. In addition, there are patents which limits the use of crystalline psilocybin. So how did we investigate this? First, we measured their chemical stability. In other words, we measure the durability of the compounds. Are the esters stable enough to survive if they are exposed to acid or base? Secondly, we looked into the metabolic stability. Hence, can the body remove the peel to release psilocin effectively? Lastly, we explored the solubility to make sure that the compounds can be absorbed by the body. Having laid out the objective of our study, let's now shift our focus to the results. Before diving into what we found, I want to provide an overview of our work. Let's start with the selection. How did we decide which esters to make? With the aim to produce psilocin esters covering a broad range from, of stabilities from really stable to unstable, we chose to make a number of esters as structurally diverse as possible. After deciding which esters to make, we moved on to synthesis and purification, which I will elaborate more on the coming slide. Let's have a look at the synthetic process. Visualize it as a roadmap where we tweak the molecule step by step, gradually refining it into our desired psilocin esters. Though it may seem linear with the arrows pointing in one direction, the process was anything but. Spanning several months, each step presented, it, presented its unique challenges. Imagine baking a cake, rarely does one get it perfect on the first try. You tinker with ingredients ratios, oven temperature, and even the order you add ingredients. Chemical synthesis operates on a similar principle. With this in mind, 15 compounds were successfully in synthesized. In addition to making different carboxylic acid esters, same type as silacetin 4A, the pro drug I mentioned before, we made other types of esters which are marked with different colors. And to be able to compare, we also made psilocybin. After the synthesized compounds were purified, they existed in the form of oil. For easier handling, we converted them into salt, which was performed by adding an acid, in this case, fumaric acid, to the esters. To ensure that we have the correct compound and that it is pure enough, we performed several different analyses. Each of these techniques offer a distinct piece of the puzzle, contributing different information about our compound. When put together, these pieces create a comprehensive picture, verifying that we indeed have the correct compound and that it is pure enough for further study. When that was established, 
it was time to test if these compounds could be viable substitute for psilocybin. Let's start with the chemical stability. This was a way to stress test the compounds to understand the shelf life and handling requirements. It was performed by treating the compounds with acid respectively base and measure how long the compounds survive in the environment. Diving into the chemical stability testing, which basically tells us how easy these compounds are to handle, led us to some interesting findings. A handful of esters proved to be interesting players, showing considerable stability in an acidic setting and moderate stability in a basic one. It should be noted that compound 5 proved some difficulties analyzing, but its notable stability during storage and handling procedures makes it a curious subject for further investigation. With these interesting findings in mind, let's now shift our focus to the metabolic stability findings. Metabolic stability means can the body release psilocin quickly? And this was performed by dissolving the esters in microsomes, respectively plasma. Then we incubated them, sampled at multiple time points, and measured how much ester is left. And here we wanted to degrade quickly. When it comes to the microsome experiment, it was like watching a magic trick. In just a blink of an eye, or to be more precise, a few minutes, most of the compounds had almost vanished, leaving us confused. Either they were metabolizing at an impressive pace, or like a stealthy spy, hiding bound to the microsomes. Interestingly, psilocybin, our compound number A, seemed to be stable in this environment, a mystery we will unravel soon. After this, we decided to investigate the stability of a few compounds in plasma to elucidate if the compounds actually were degraded that fast. Let's have a look at the result. The graphs here display how rapidly the chosen compounds degraded in plasma. Remarkably, after just five minutes, almost no compound remained in the plasma solution. This is precisely what we were hoping for. Quick conversion in the body, but there's a twist. Psilocybin or compound A didn't degrade at all. Contrary to popular belief of its rapid degradation after ingestion, psilocybin shows surprising stability in both plasma and beaver microsomes in our study. This led us to postulate that enzymes responsible for psilocybin's conversion, phosphatases, might be more abundant in other organs than liver and blood. As we move closer to the end of our exploration, Let's reflect on their implications for future research. In summary, we found four promising candidates. These compounds stood out due to their chemical stability and rapid metabolism. The rapid conversion to psilocin of these candidates is a particularly um, important attribute. It could reduce the risk of prodrug interaction, a phenomenon that might cause undesirable effects and toxicity. The outcomes of our study offer promising indications that psilocin esters might serve as practical as the alternative to psilocybin. Not only do they exist outside the boundaries of psilocybin patents, but they also present a potentially economical substitute. So why does this matter? Well, the escalating demand for medical grade psilocybin underscores the need for cost effective and efficient production met methods. This need becomes more pressing should psilocybin gain approval as a drug treatment. And this doesn't just matter to scientists, to doctors or to pharmaceutical companies. It matters to us all. It's significant to people like me and anyone else who might benefit from these potential treatments. This is why our work is so crucial. It's a, it is a, about making progress in the field of psychedelic research, yes. But it is also about accessibility. It's about ensuring that those who need these treatments can access them, that they are not barred by cost or availability. As we move forward, let's remember that this isn't just about psychedelic research. It's about people. It's about the little girl who struggled, the teenager who fought her de demons, and the woman standing before you here today forever changed by her experiences with these powerful compounds. 
it's about you and it's about the future where everyone can access the help they need. Thank you for joining me on this journey. Let's keep boundary, pushing boundaries and breaking down barriers together. Before we finish, I want to extend my gratitude to, to, to a number of people. My supervisor, Ulf Bremberg, for his empowering guidance and Luke Odell for enabling psychedelic research. Thanks to the Redley team and everyone else who has helped me on this journey. Thank you all for your time today.